Welcome to Red, White, and Blue. I'm Gary Pollan from the right. And on today's show, I'll be from the left. Uh, as always, David. <laughs> uh, this week, we're going to be talking about free speech versus public safety on college campuses and generally in society. And we have two really interesting guests, and I think it's a unique opportunity, David, for us to have outstanding students from the University of Houston involved in the speech and debate department come talk to us, because this is the future. They're, majoring, they're majoring in other things, by okay, the way. Okay, but there's speech and debate. We may hear some things about engineering. I don't know. I hope not. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm going to go ladies first, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Catherine Pokinghorn uh, from Cornwall, but really from uh, the United States. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. And also here, Jackson Bartling uh, from the United States. Okay, so. Both legally in the country. Uh, yeah. Presumably there are regulations about uh, what you can do with uh, speech today on the campus of the University of Houston. Let me just tell you, when I was here, uh, it was a free ride. I stood on the steps of the University Center, not, you know, a football field from where we we're sitting, and made a speech to a rally of anti-war protesters and called Richard Nixon, who was not yet even on the radar of a Watergate committee, a crook. Okay? And nobody said a word. I also witnessed a pharmacy student named Mickey Leland rally, and he was not f from U of H. Later a congressman. Later a congressman. He was not from U of H at the time, but he had rallied a group of students who were protesting the incarceration of a black man who, was, who had 30 years d for one marijuana cigarette. It was Lee Otis. Lee Otis Johnson. Right. And when the governor of Texas drove up, the Democratic they, governor of Texas. Democratic governor of Texas. They fought, they, <laughs> first of all, they yelled at him. Then they followed him up to the hall or the room where he was supposed to make a speech and ran him off. Yeah, but that's not the best part of the story. The best part of the story is they were, the protesters were saying, free Leotis, free Leotis. And Preston Smith, the Democratic governor, didn't hear him right. He thought they were saying free Olas. Beans. That's what he thought. <laughs> yeah, that's a you know so, great standard for the Democrats. Uh, my guess party. is my guess is that um, that could happen today or not, based on and, and and what is your approval or not of me having called the president a crook? I mean, I uh, and um, you're consistent David, and shouting people that. down so that they cannot be heard, which is Wait, happening on campuses. Well, no, you didn't do that. No, I did. I just watched it. I was complicit. Okay. <laughs> All right. Who wants to go first? Um, well, I think uh, that the university has always been a place where uh, we work through sort of explosive ideas that might be difficult to discuss or, you know, bring to the forefront in other areas. And I think that if you were going to call Richard Nixon a crook anywhere, uh, maybe the university center was exactly the place to do it <laughs> because it is sort of a petri dish or a laboratory like for those ideas to um, be discussed and deliberated over. Uh, Whereas maybe in other environments, it might not be quite as beneficial or productive, so. Well, I'll tell you, as, as, as someone uh, who was also very active on the campus, I was uh, around the same time as the Vietnam warrior long before y'all were born. But, uh, and there was massive speech on the campus. There was a lot of protesting, uh, but available and open. And I also think that at the time we were growing up, David, I think there was opportunities for, for different opinions to be stated. I remember I went to the University of Texas, but on campus, you know, all kinds of different speakers. You know, radical leftists, or liberals, or conservatives, radical conservatives, the whole, whole avenue of different opinions because then the idea of the university was a place where you could have the marketplace of ideas and you could be exposed to all these different things that coming from your background and history and your life, you don't necessarily get to see. So is it, good, is it a good idea for people to be able to shout people down who are stating opinions that a group of people find offensive because that is what's happening today. It may not be on college campuses, but that's oh, what happened. On college that's what, uh, well, yeah, it is. But that's what happened on the campus at U of H. Um, is that carrying <laughs> free speech too far? Well, dealing with uh, shouting down people at least, I think that also relates to what we see in uh, various college campuses where um, like a speaker is invited to come speak and then we see protests against them and um, I like why this happens is actually because the process that speakers come to the campus with is for like some student group, they'll decide they want them, they'll uh, send a petition to some committee. The committee's like, okay, we'll set up this time at this place, start advertising. And that's when the majority of the community of the college will hear about it. 
And that's when the, the discussion about if they want that speaker to come in the first place actually happens, which is why we can see like with speakers such as Ann Coulter, there's violent protests against them coming to the campus. It's because the process doesn't necessarily include the community until the invite has been sent. Well, but how about this as a concern? Shouldn't she be heard? I mean, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't, if you're, in fact, one of the problems we have in society today is you probably all recognize because you've grown up in it. We, we get our news and information from the, the sources we trust. And everyone doesn't trust the same sources anymore like it used to be. We also used to get the national news from one of the major networks. Now people look all over the place and they get reinforced. The problem with that is you don't get any exposure to other different ideas. And so you kind of get stagnant. But not inviting Ann Coulter, who is an acquired taste, I agree, and I'm a conservative. Uh, to let whoever wants to hear her hear, what is the big deal? Why should we silence her? Why should people be allowed, David, to shout her down and not let her have her speech? People want to protest on the outside, you know, that we think she's whatever, smokes too much, obnoxious, too blonde, whatever they want to protest is fine, but should, should her speech be cut off? Well, I think that conservative speakers and of various ideologies should be able to come to campuses and speak, but the primary uh, focus of campuses is a learning environment so we need to assess the quality of the speakers who come and not just anybody who says, I want to speak at a campus should be able to. So we need to ensure that there's quality speakers for conservatives. We don't want just neo-Nazis coming to rally. Okay, Lan Coulter is considered a quality speaker. I think she gets 10 or 15 or 20,000 a speech. So she's mm -hmm. a real sp spokesman, maybe not for an idea you like. So the question is, <laughs> should that the exposure of different ideas be allowed on a university campus? We're gonna just flush free speech right down the toilet in America. Because right. this is, by the way, this is gonna be y'all's country in another decade. You're going to be, you'll be in the process of starting to take over the institutions. Do you want to flush free speech down the toilet as part of that? We all support free speech, but what, what needs to be maintained is an atmosphere where vigorous debate can be held, and that's why limits on free speech need to be implemented to protect it so it's not just unfettered, okay. unfiltered I'm speech. I'm missing something here. Okay, do you agree with me? Uh, that we do, do ask, does she I agree mean, with him? Yeah, do you agree with this, this, <laughs> well, this idea mean, that we need to limit free speech to preserve free speech? That sounds like out of 1984, like war is peace. Yeah, uh, well, it's, you know? it's definitely like a fine line or sort of like a, a tricky like balance to strike uh, because there's definitely this sort of situation where, uh, like you just said, like doesn't she deserve to be heard? Well, I, I mean, in order for her to be heard, like, other people have to be quiet. So you have to sort of like split the difference between like who, whose speech is, whose speech is being protected because if their speech isn't being protected then they can't be well, heard. So I think that's kind of what Jackson is getting into, but. Yeah. Um, well, he's wrong. Well, <laughs> yeah. here's, here's sorry, what's going Jackson. on. I like you, you seem like here's a nice guy. Um, but if you invite someone, if someone's invited by a campus group to speak on the campus, they should be allowed to speak. The protesters should be outside protesting. If there's a question and answer period and they have questions to ask, they should absolutely be allowed to ask. And, and it's not just conservatives. When the liberals come on campus and the same thing happens and conservatives don't like them, same thing. They should be able to be able to make their presentation. Here's what Poland's doing. And there's, a parallel, be there's a po parallel question for you to address, perhaps, uh, if you're not going to be into another speech of any kind. <laughs> um, uh, and that is in Poland now, there is a national law that says if you speak at all about the nation of Poland having been complicit with the Holocaust, you go to jail. All right? So, um, on the flip side of that is, in places like Germany and France, if you deny the Holocaust happened, you can also be penalized. I'm sure Gary would approve of one and not the other Actually, of those examples. I can speak, uh, what for, you? I can speak for myself. And well, I, I, okay. I I well, let me ask, so every, ask everybody else yeah. whether or not you approve See, I of, think that this is a really good example of how it can be really dangerous to sort of start imposing uh, restrictions on free speech because obviously uh, you can kind of like see maybe, and I haven't like read a, a bunch about the issue, but you can kind of see where they're coming from, right? Like it would be really bad if, uh, you know, uh, maybe neo-Nazis like began to identify like with that period of history and to like, uh, you know. What about Holocaust deniers? Uh, Should they go to jail? I think Holocaust deniers should receive some penalty for denying historical facts that impacted the lives of many people. Okay, well, what would you say about uh, a, a rule of law that says that anyone who says that there are no effects uh, on black people today from slavery and that if you 
don't concede that or you oppose that and say that that didn't happen, uh, is that a reason to uh, penalize anyone? Well, I think you've presented two separate things. There's one, on one hand, the denying that, the, that there was ever a problem, and then there's the denying that a problem is still going on. I think if you deny that there was ever a problem, it could be seen as similar to denying the Holocaust, whereas if you just deny it's still a problem, um, you're just wrong, and you should be convinced that you're wrong. You shouldn't face legal penalty for that. Yeah, it's a restriction mm. on free speech, David, mm. either way you look at it. But here's, here's another interesting thing. The chancellor of the University of California, Berkeley, and of course that's a noted uh, campus for no free speech, lots of riots, out of control. She stated at the beginning of this year, uh, the best response to hate speech is more speech rather than trying to shut down others. And when she said that shielding students from uncomfortable views would not serve them well. So she declared a free speech year on, on the University of Cal California, Berkeley. I don't know how it's working out because uh, of the troubles there, but does she think she's making sense? Um, I think that this is definitely something that resonates with uh, like my sort of conclusions in researching this issue. Uh, I think that um, there's something to be said for uh, the tunnel vision that can kind of occur when we do have sort of very selected exposure uh, to viewpoints that might be like unsavory to us uh, and I think that especially on university campuses where like uh, students are really developing their own identity individually like academically etc uh, I think it's really important that these things that they're exposed to these things and like given a chance to protest these things and given a chance to debate and deliberate over these things because otherwise uh, if they've never heard it before like how are they going to like Think through it, and or, or the thought check that you, you 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 know everything you need to know yeah. about an issue, and there's nothing else to learn. I mean, well, you, even David learns well. things. If, when have he you heard? On the show. Uh, have you seen any evidence of Vanguard Texas and their flyers, which the Anti Defamation League has reported on that is happening and on campuses? And in fact, in February of this year, those campuses uh, at uh, Texas State. Uh, Rice, University of North Texas, Abilene Christian, University of Texas, and UT Dallas all had flyers sponsored by this organization outside uh, saying that uh, asking people to report any Muslim activity that they know of and, and to imagine a Muslim free America. That's, okay. And by the way, the, the, the University of Texas at Dallas flyers occurred the day after the Trump executive order barring Muslims from um, seven countries from being admitted to the United so what's States. what's your question? Well, is it okay to uh, uh, have those flyers on campus from an outside group? Yeah, see, that, that's, the, again, like, it's just sort of like a double-edged blade. Like, yeah, I think that's awful, and, like, I am sure that it was not a good feeling for anyone to uh, be seeing those flyers. Uh, however, at the same time, if you were to say, oh, you can't put up those flyers, then like, once that precedent is set, who's to stop the next sort of person in control of what is and isn't uh, free, what, what is and isn't free speech? Like, who's to stop them from turning around and saying, oh, well now you're not allowed to like express your faith on campus. So I think that it's just one of those things where it's like, uh, nobody wants that to happen. Like nobody it's, wants uh, harassment or violence. Have you seen these examples of this flyers at the campus here? The Vanguard Texas flyers, yeah. no. Okay. They didn't come to U of H. Okay, you talked about faith and and, and the, right. the slippery slope, Jackson. Since you, this is kind of your area, Texas Women's University this year advised students and faculty not to use the word holiday when describing parties in December because it connotes religious tradition and that might be offensive to non-religious people. Are you kidding me? We can't call it a holiday Which is an party ever growing, now. an ever growing population. Good. You think that we're at this point <laughs> in America that you cannot describe a holiday party as a holiday party? I mean, how can anyone be offended by that? If things just really gotten out of control with the politically correct speech, I mean, you got to be really careful about when you talk about anything, because my God, somebody might get offended. Isn't it time for us to tell people, you know, if you don't like it, okay, ignore it. You don't have to get offended. You know, there may be things you offend, and the point you made is so significant as this, the slippery slope that'll happen to somebody else. So today's Ann Coulter, who you don't want to hear from because you think she's an agitator, uh, tomorrow could be uh, John Cornyn, Republican senator, who, by the way, denied the right to speak at the Texas Southern University where they raised hell and basically ran him off with, no, with shouting and hollering. 
Is that how we communicate in a modern democracy? Is that where you want to go? Well, dealing with the slippery slope thing, um, I think that leads into how we can create restrictions in such a way that that won't allow the slippery slope to happen, and it will be difficult, but I do think it's possible. For example, like um, we can allow speakers that have conscientiousness of <clears throat> the campus environment, and also if there is security concerns for that speaker and they're willing to pay their own security expenses. Why should there be security concerns when we're on a university campus where there's supposed to be an exchange of ideas? Well, Why should that ever well, happen? Because free speech has to be for everybody, you know, if the, if the speaker can come, then the protesters have to be able to protest. Well, let me tell you what yeah, University of Texas, let me tell me what your, let me tell them what, in you, what your university <laughs> did with those I don't, flyers. I don't want them. Well, they have, <laughs> they have rules that say you cannot put a flyer on a building mm -hmm. and you cannot come onto their campus mm -hmm. if you're not a student or a representative of a student organization and do anything such as printing flyers and handing them out. Right. So, um, is that, a, is, that a, is that too strict a control on uh, those who are promoting hate, which is what these people are doing? I, th I think that's a pretty fair restriction to keep out outside people from coming into campus to put up um, controversial and inflammatory material. What would you consider inflammatory material? For example, like the part of the poster that you described where it says, we dream of a Muslim free America, mm -hmm. like that. Like, I don't think someone writes that thinking no one's going to get mad about it. Okay, let's define hate <laughs> Let's define, let's put some, you know, parameters around hate speech. Is it hate speech for the chief of staff of the United States to, who say that the dreamers who didn't sign up in time are just lazy? They're all, mm. they're all Mexicans. Is that hate speech to say that, some, because kidding? that's what he said. I'm just okay. asking if it's hate speech. No. It's, um, it's common, David. I mean, I think that a lot of these terms, hate like speech. hate speech, uh, like verbal harassment, like these terms are things that are sort of coming to have more strict definitions, but I don't think those definitions are really here yet. Uh, like I would say that depending on like the platform where that was, I think that's definitely probably hateful, but like depending on the platform it was broadcasted over, depending on the audience, depending on the circumstance, like I think that those things also come into play. And I think that in the next, you know, few years, in the next like decade, we'll probably see a lot more like a precise definitions of terms like hate speech. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, we'll just have to kind of you know wait and value, see. You know what the value of labeling something as hate speech is? What? to encourage people not to listen, to discourage the, mm. the exchange of ideas yeah. because it's used liberally. Because if you know, David tries to call this hate speech. I know, didn't call it, I asked the question. I dream of a Muslim free America, that's, that's hate speech. Yes. I agree with yeah. you. This, no, there's no, it's okay. not even well, close. That's, that's but, David assume, want, yeah. but David and his ilk would like people to think of it that way <laughs> so they don't listen to the other side of the argument. The truth is with dreamers, as you know, everyone was given the opportunity to sign up for the program, they didn't. So what David's saying, I guess, is it, it didn't matter because that he believes in open borders. So it doesn't matter. That's what it is. <laughs> I don't That's see the, the debate. I don't on see the, the relationship sure between calling is. people lazy and open borders. But no, then, they had the opportunity to sign up. They didn't do it. Well, okay? is it? Is it? I mean, here's another. Here's another example. Is it hate speech to accuse <laughs> another? Notice uh, it's always attacks on conservatives from him. You another uh, another American of uh, being treasonous when you know, as a fact, that it is not so. Mm. The uh, case under about? the Constitution of the United States. Okay, are we talking that you about actually have to be in a war position to uh, be accused of treason. Okay. Now, uh, so is since, <laughs> since I want to see if we're, we're understanding the people facts are you're not, talking about. Well, you know, is it is it hate speech to call people treasonous when you know it's not the case? Uh, you mean is it slander? Because I, th you That's know, that he doesn't know his like, terms. That sounds like slander. So this, this is what I'm saying. Like there are a lot of things that people can say that are like hurtful or offensive or like detrimental to mm -hmm. an educative environment. Right. And I think that sort of classifying those things and figuring out why those classifications are negative and like not beneficial, I think that's really important. So like that, like I would call falsely accusing someone of treason, like I would say that's probably slander and libel. Yeah, I don't know, um, what, I don't know what you were referring to. And that's to, illegal, and there are reasons John Kerry why that's illegal, trying, so. telling the Palestinians not to deal with Trump because he'll be gone in a year? No. Yeah, no, that no, would no, be no. treason. It was Trump, yes. it was Trump who was saying the people that didn't clap for him were tre treason. Well, that's stupid is what that is. Oh, okay. Okay, you well, know, that's uh, stupid uh, speech. Oh, well, we are not treason in speech. We're in agreement. Yeah, he just, you know, he's not perfect, you know, I admit it. Can we, can we control 
hate speech. Should be t we be trying to control hate speech more? I mean, this guy Richard Spencer, who's a member of the alt right, went to the inauguration of Donald Trump and was punched. And now there's a there's a the website says, is it okay to punch a Nazi? <laughs> And everybody is approving yeah, of well, this. Of, it's of, not. Uh, now, <laughs> then there was a black woman at Charlottesville who was attacked by one of the ralliers of the uh, uh, white supremacist crowd. So, you know, is, is this kind of violence, what you, do you see that as something that is a consequence of some other societal forces or governmental forces? I think since you brought up, since you brought up violence and clashing of neo-Nazis like Richard Spencer and like Antifa who poses them. Um, that brings up why some restrictions on speech on college campuses is needed in the first place. Because if we let neo-Nazis come have a rally, that then brings other radical left groups to counter protest them, which then results in violence, which takes away from college as an educational space. And which these is, are, but these are outside campus forces too, so they don't have a right to be on Well, the they could be neo-Nazi anyway. students that are rallying. Really? How many neo-Nazis go to U of H? You know any? <laughs> Not me. Okay, I've never seen any. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's made of a big deal. But it's interesting about what happened there and the violence that took mm -hmm. place. Think about this. The Nazis are coming to U of H and they're going to give a speech and there's a student group, two students are, th are Nazis, okay? And they invite Spencer to come to the campus. And the, the campus community as it itself says, you know what the best thing to do about this guy? Ignore him. Not protest, not show up. He'll show up, he'll talk to two people. And the media will say, well, this is a non-story. We're not covering it. And that's how you get rid of the hate speech in America. When you have clashes, everybody shows up and they're raising hell in the TV coverage. You're just playing into what the radical forces want on both sides. I have to say, like, I think that there is something to be said for sort of the dialogue that is created uh, in not radicalism, obviously, but like in the sort of conflict between these forces. And I think that that's something that's really valuable about having free speech on campuses. I think that, uh, as I said earlier, I think that campuses are really a vital place for people to sort of have their views checked and for people to formulate, uh, you know, conversations about, uh, about different viewpoints. Uh, and I think that, um, I think that when there are protests or like when there is conversation about controversy on campuses, I, th I think that that's, that's good. And obviously like violence, not so good. But uh, again, like this just comes to the point that like we already have laws to protect us against like physical assault right, so or today, in the campus assault, world we live in today, the campus world that you, you yeah, all live in, right. uh, do students have the opportunity to go listen and get diverse ideas and actually hear them? They kind of listen to what different people have to say as they formulate their worldviews. In, in my experience at the University of Houston, I have met with various different ideologies and groups. For example, there's the evangelicals who come in front of the library and hold up signs yeah. with a list of people who are going to hell. Like, <laughs> was David on that? <laughs> 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 well, when I, when I was at U of H, they had uh, well, a, the, the, the Hall of Fame. The Right to Life hell. people had a table with what looked like fetuses in bottles and asking people oh, to sign man. up uh, for pro-life positions. It was, it was pretty gross. But nobody got rid of them. They were, they were given the space. Uh, so now what about when the government does things that uh, incite uh, violence, such as when uh, you take white nationalist groups off of the list of people to be watched and monitored by the Department of Justice, which just happened. You know, so the, the program that was once called the Countering Violent Extremism Program has been changed to Countering Islamic uh, Terrorism. All right, so there's, now we have two programs. And then we have the other one, we have a draft today of the Homeland Security Department that says that Sunni Muslims need to be continuously vetted throughout the United States. Okay, so what's yeah. your question? I mean, is inspiration to violence? Not so far. Um, I, th <laughs> I, th I think I might be failing to understand uh, his point. The, you, yeah. the connection between the. Well, you don't you don't believe the, there can be a connection between government spe spokespersons? Oh, you're saying and like the, the like the backlash to these actions yes. might lead to violence. So far, not. Um. Well, I I think that. That's definitely a confusing decision. I think that uh, the government probably, I think there are a lot of cases where uh, domestic terrorism is called something 
uh, besides domestic terrorism and uh, things sort of get parsed out along lines that they shouldn't and that's that's not She's good. She's skeptical but, of the uh, government, yeah. David. But, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe a little bit. Um, Jackson? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's possible that government actions can inspire violence in groups, but yeah. doesn't necessarily seem related to the issue of on-campus free speech. Yeah, on-campus specifically, I don't know. You mean insane. like the violence when the neo-Nazis in Antifa fought in Virginia and the police watched? Do you remember that? They knew it was coming, they didn't separate them, just let them go at it, to like, for whatever reason. Sorry, sorry, we had to bring in all of these extraneous topics <laughs> <laughs> beyond, the, beyond the campus. Uh, well, it's but tied into the whole thing, though, David. I, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. You know, I'm just glad I'm not in Poland. Uh, <laughs> so, God. thanks to both of you for being here and That's adding your views to it, and thanks to Gary for being so excited about <laughs> his opportunities. <laughs> thanks for coming, both of you. Yeah. Got a great future. We'll uh, be back next week on Red, White, and Blue. <laughs>